I've been with Canonical about six years and I've worked predominantly on OpenStack for that period on distribution and de deployment tooling in the form of the OpenStack charts for GG. So I wanted to talk a bit, a bit about complexity in OpenStack. So you've seen this picture before, it's relatively well known. Um, and it, it represents the OpenStack services as they were five years ago. Um, so it's actually quite an old picture. Um, it's got a lot more complicated since then. Um, but, but ultimately, it represents all the different services, the, the demons that run in each part of OpenStack for Nova, uh, Neutron, Cinder, Keystone, Glance, and the OpenStack dashboard, their databases, their, their message brokers they require to communicate within themselves, and the APIs they expose. Um, and as you can see, it's a fantastic picture, a very kind of service-oriented architecture from that perspective. Um, but, but as a result, it's quite easy to get it wrong when you try and deploy it. And I think a lot of people have found that. As I said, it's, it's not got any easier. So five years on, that's the current kind of heat map of uh, OpenStack projects. As it's grown, uh, there's been, been a lot of uh, projects built on top of OpenStack to provide kind of PaaS type capabilities for databases and big data and, and stuff like that. And it's just got more and more complicated is the honest truth, not so much. So as I said, I've been a canonical while. And, and, and uh, when we were looking at OpenStack, we were the, Juju was kind of very much in its infancy, and we were thinking about how we might deploy it. So uh, we wrote some code. We, we, we wrote the initial commits on the Nova Compute Charm back in 2011, so quite a long time ago now. And th that same code base has been evolving ever since then to, to drive in the, uh, the, the model changes that for deploying OpenStack over time and improving the, the scale out and the, and the operational actions on top of uh, OpenStack. So that was a while back. Um, and what we found is it allows us to basically redraw that picture, but in terms of applications and the relations between them and the configuration of those things. Uh, and that's, that's taken from, from the GG GUI, and we'll look at one of those in a bit more detail uh, when I talk about flexibility of architecture of choice. So we get to GG deploy OpenStack, um, and it was pretty, pretty cool. The hell, it took 21 servers. It was ridiculous. Like, you, you ended up having to have loads and loads of hardware, even just to try it. Um, so how did, how did we work through that? So GG a feature to be able to manage machine containers. So a machine container is very different to an application container in that it models a whole machine rather than a single process, as you would find in a, say, a Docker container, for example. So a machine, machine container has SSH, it has syslog, you can, you can connect to it, it has an IP address that's addressable. Um, and, and it allows us to take chunks of that deployment and rather than put them on physical servers, we can place them in machine containers on physical servers. So we can start increasing the density of, of our deployment. Originally this was done using LXC, which is the original Linux containers project. And, uh, and then for GG20, which uh, uh, was uh, GA last year, we switched to, to LexD. And LexD is just an evolution of LXC. So LXC is the underlying library. And, and some original command line tooling. LexD is a daemon on top of that that provides a number of uh, high level abstractions for, for managing, managing containers on a, on a, a single server. And uh, that's proven pretty effective. So using GG, we can now place um, units of a particular service on a particular machine. So using this two notation, we can do GG deploy to uh, LexD container on physical machine zero. So that's how you address a physical uh, machine within a within a GG model, and we can add units to, to uh, other physical machines to ensure that the, the individual units that are making up a particular service are distributed as as well as possible across the underlying physical infrastructure. We can wrap that into a bundle as well. Um, so this is just a snippet from a bundle that shows you the 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 monitor aspect of uh, SEF deployment being deployed in LexD containers across three physical machines. Again, we've just codified this in a bundle so that it's then uh, reproducible and repeatable for, for a, given, a given topology. So we get to GG deploy OpenStack, and it's much better now. It's four servers, and that gives you three compute nodes as well. So, um, you know, we, we're trying to squeeze as much out of the hardware as possible. So, in, in that particular reference point, which is the OpenStack base bundle on jujucharms.com, um, it's three compute nodes, which also double up as storage nodes. You get a network node for your north-south traffic routing and DHCP services. And everything else is farmed across that as LexD containers. So all, all of the, the OpenStack control plane is containerized uh, to get a, a really good de dense deployment. 
you can even bake a bit of HA into that as well, because you've got four machines, and three is really enough to do any, t any level of HA on the control plane. Um, it's still pretty dense. You might not want to do that with four machines. You might want to grow it a bit further before you start doing that. But it is possible to, to, to model multiple units of services across the underlying physical servers and then use uh, our HA cluster charm to then cluster those and provide VIPs for access, that type of stuff. Okay, so let's um, switch to a, a quick demo of this. Uh, first thing I'm going to show you is uh, a bundle. So I know uh, Rick and Marco talked about this, this before. Um, th this is a bundle, but this bit at the top you can ignore, that's just some clever YAML so we don't have to keep repeating things in, in underlying config uh, as we go down. Uh, you can see here we've got um, four machines. Um, we just specified these as architecture AMD64. Um, Juju works equally as well on power or ARM architectures, so that they, when we do deploy and test on those things. So in, for this one it's an x86. We've then got the list of relations between various services and their types. Um, and then we can see the various different things. So that Ceph Mon, one I just referenced in the slide, is, is there. The Ceph OSDs, which are the actual object storage daemons, are being placed directly on hardware. So you can see that with this syntax here. That's being direct, directly placed on physical machines. Uh, so we've got a Redis gateway for some API access to, to Ceph, Glance, Keystone, MySQL, Neutron, a few other Neutron bits and pieces, and then the, the Nova and OpenStack dashboard. Okay, so I've got this pre-deployed. Um, so, right. this is a MAS uh, deployment in one of our labs. Uh, so, if we have a quick look at this, if I shrink that a bit. Is that still visible to everybody? Is that good? Okay. So, um, you can see all the various different services we've got deployed. You can see. Some of these have been placed in, in LexD containers as per the deployment directive, and, and some of them are, are directly on physical machines. We can, we can drill into those a little, in a little bit more detail by scoping. So if we look at the Nova Compute service, um, we can also see uh, that it's on machines one, two, and three. I was hoping it was going to show me the set bit as well, but it's not. Okay, so that, that may have changed with the, the current version of Juju I'm using. But ultimately, you can start seeing how your deployment is laid out and how the how the placement's working. So I'm just gonna SSH to one of those containers. So we'll look at the glance service. Um, so we can tell we're in a container. Uh, right, we're in an LXE container. It's been managed managed by LXD but it's still an LXE container under the hood. Um, we can see the, the running processes in this. So this container has its own, own uh, process space. We can see all the, the basic system daemons and then the guards processes themselves. So it kind of gives you a bit of a flavor. You can see all of this same information from the Juju GUI as well. So you can see the same four machines here. And then you can see how the um, services are being placed in the LXD containers. So you can drive everything from the command line or you can drive it from the GUI. Um, once you've run a few of these things in the GUI, you must be able to switch to the command line. It's much easier to manage uh, YAML files and Git repos for, for deployment configurations than doing stuff like the GUI. But it is handy just to, to get a, a snapshot view of exactly what you've got deployed. Okay. <coughs> so I, I, I probably haven't used the word converge, but I, I, I definitely use the word uh, quite, quite dense, high, de high density deployment. So. Has everybody heard of converged architecture in the context of OpenStack? So this is where you multipurpose the underlying physical servers to, to perform multiple roles within the cloud. So a lot of people might deploy their OpenStack cloud like this. So they have maybe three servers, and they host all of the control plane services across those three servers. Um, so all of the message bus, all of the, the database, all of the control plane API services get pushed on some dedicated hardware and they build an HA cluster across that to, to manage the availability of those services. And then you'd split out um, your compute services onto dedicated hardware and maybe your storage services onto dedicated hardware as well. So you completely segregate everything, you manage each in its own silo, um, and, and you know, for a lot of people that, that works quite well. But there are, there are some drawbacks to that, because if you lose one of those control plane services, you lose a third of the capacity of everything in your control plane, straight up. 
we look at the converged architecture, which is kind of the um, opposite of that. Basically, we put everything everywhere. So um, we combine the, the underlying compute and storage um, services onto the same hardware. So we were able to slice that up so that compute gets a good chunk of CTP and memory for running tenant instances. And the, you know, in this example, Ceph, object storage daemons get an appropriate amount of memory and processor and disk to be able to provide storage services across the cloud. And then using LexD, we spread all of the control plane services in LexD containers across as many servers as possible. So if you're in a uh, physical server deployment, say, of 100 servers, I think we have 27 containers for an HA deployment in terms of control plane bits and pieces that need to go down. So uh, a single server failure within your cloud, so if you get a full server outage, A, it might not even impact the control plane because it may fall onto a, machine, a physical server that isn't providing control, control plane containers. And if it does, you lose one container of one service. So the impact of um, uh, server downtime is, mu is much more reduced by taking this approach and trying to spread things as far as possible. It also helps with scale, so if you need to add to some capacity to a particular API service, um, then you can expand that individually across uh, available um, server resources. In the cloud. And uh, what I would say is that the uh, Juju in the open stack trams give you flexibility to mix and match this as much as possible. So you can do the classic model, you can do the fully converged model, or you can go for a halfway hat. So you, some people like to split up their storage, maybe they can um, buy particular servers at a very good competitive rate for storage and they want to grow that at a different rate, so the underlying compute capacity. So we're able to kind of split these things up and let people manage the infrastructure in the way that works best from them, both from a kind of risk perspective and a cost perspective. Okay, so we talk quite a lot about um, the, the number of services and complexity of OpenStack, and then we get, we get the network guy come and give us something like this. So you want to play OpenStack, you've got to fit it in my data center, and work all these different security rules about where you can place where, and databases can't be exposed on the internet. So we end up having to map OpenStack into relatively complex network topology. So how do we do that in charms? Well, this picture we drew probably three or four years ago now about a kind of idealized OpenStack network topology in terms of how you want to split stuff up. So most OpenStack API services will expose three endpoint types, a public facing endpoint, an internal endpoint, and an admin endpoint. And depending on the service, some of those endpoints will only serve certain types of requests. So for Keystone, for example, the admin endpoint will allow <coughs> cloud admin operations, which you can't do on the public endpoint by default. You can change that if you want to, but you probably don't want to. Um, in the same way, we've got the, the different API endpoints for the OpenStack services. We also need, want to push out tenant network traffic, so that's not on the same network segments as internal API traffic, for example. So that's the uh, blue network on the right-hand side. It's what we call the data network. So that's a network that's probably quite high capacity, maybe 10 gig networking in a busy cloud. And that's providing uh, networking connectivity between instances on the cloud and out to, out of and into the instances in the cloud as well. So it connects to the, the neutral, neutral gateway network nodes, which go to the outside world, but it also connects to all the uh, underlying compute nodes as well. And then we've got some storage related networks at the bottom. Again, relatively high capacity to make sure that you can get the required performance characteristics in your underlying storage, um, hopefully relatively low latency as well, because uh, that does have quite an impact on, on under underlying IO performance. And then uh, potentially a separate network for um, cluster operations on your storage cluster as well. So if you lose a node and things have to resync, you don't necessarily want to pipe that over the same network that you're providing storage services to consuming services. So just make sure you can you can manage the, the network flows effectively across your cluster and, and um, you know, keep, keep things separate. So how do we do that in Juju? So Juju 2.0 um, models uh, networking directly. Um, in the past, we've taken various approaches to, to, to managing network configuration by uh, config options on charms. So it's, it's proven effective, but quite brittle, um, because Juju has no knowledge about, wasn't previously um, uh, mapping, and that one didn't contain knowledge about what uh, networks a particular unit had. So the Juju network spaces, that then all moves up into the Juju model. So it allows us to 
model what are called uh, a, a space. So a space is a collection of networks which have mutual routability, so maybe no firewalls between them, just routing, um, and have an equivalent security uh, level. So in, in this example here, for public, internal admin, and storage networks, um, and there they're kind of the, the four um, spaces within our data center that we need to map services into. So we look at one of those in detail. So say we look at the public network, and, and not my example here, it's got five subnets. And the reason it's got five subnets is because in my data center, I can't take a subnet out the top of a rack. Um, it's quite common in, in larger data center deployments it's, uh, to do routing between racks and to not um, expand broadcast domains and subnet configurations past the top of rack switch. So uh, when I deploy my um, <coughs> my uh, Glance API services, I can ensure that I get placement across all five racks for uh, availability of underlying power and networking structure. And each, each of those units will be bound um, to the subnet that relates to the, its placement within the data center. So they, cannot, they can see each other via Juju, they, we've got the peer relations that allow them to cluster properly, um, but they're, they're ultimately spread across, un, un, um, spread across the underlying failure domains whether that be power, networking, whatever it might be. So by, man by managing the, this at the space level, we combined a s an application to spaces, and then how that actually translates into network IP addresses once it's deployed is then modeled as the subnets within, within the space. And again, we can do this in bundles um, or via the command line. Um, for a, if you're a charm author, then this is how you access that piece of information. So when a, a user expresses intent about how they want their service to be deployed, we use the network git um, hook tool to say, okay, I, I'm dealing with this relation. In this case, it's how I'm going to access my MySQL database. Tell me which IP address I need to be using for that access path. So it then means that the, the MySQL charm can do an appropriate ACL to ensure that traffic for that particular username password only comes from this IP address that the, ch the, the charm has provided. That allows you to, to kind of tie down and direct those flows across the underlying network infrastructure, but with a modeled, abstracted view of those. So we get to Juju deploy OpenStack, and our network guy is happy again, uh, which is a good thing, because they generally aren't very happy people in my experience, and I have been one, and I was definitely not happy when I was one. Um, so that kind of brings in, in the networking element. And the last, last thing I wanted to talk about was um, uh, GG storage. So we, we talked about how we kind of slice and dice um, processor and memory and, and spread our, our OpenStack deployment up across physical server infrastructure. Talked about networking. But the kind of third element of this is, is how you consume stu storage resources within GG. And, and actually, this has been in GG for a while. I think it was introduced in 125, I believe. Um, not across all <coughs> providers, but it allows GG to uh, create in cloud environments block devices and present those to units of an application. And there's, there's hooks in, in that you can write in a charm to, to, again, to be able to retrieve the information from a charm's perspective and then consume those block devices into, into your application. So we get, we get this type of uh, syntax on the command line for that. So we can basically provide a storage directive um, for the Ceph OSD charm. Um, we can provide a, a, an OSD, OSD devices binding for storage. And in, in this syntax here, we're, we're expressing the requirement for five one terabyte block devices. Um, and then Juju will make an appropriate scheduling decision about where to place these across the underlying infrastructure to be able to fulfill that requirement. Now, for, for MANS, this is currently a, <coughs> a deploy time only option. You can't change it once you've deployed. Um, I, that probably will change over time. In the cloud, that's not, not true because obviously in the cloud, you can just create new block devices and add them to, to virtual machine instances. So, the, the feel of this feature across different substrates is, can be a little bit different. Okay, so hopefully it's given you a bit of an overview about how you can use uh, Juju and the various um, mechanisms it has for network binding, storage, provisioning, and, and for, for machine placement to, to massage a uh, complex software deployment like OpenStack into the, the required architecture for your particular use cases. So if anybody's got any questions, I'd be delighted to answer them. Okay. Um, one at the back. So do you need to control networks 
basic support it is, it is available only in MAS or other providers? Um, so it's available in MAS and I'm looking at Rick because he'll know which other clouds it's available. I think it EC2 has some support. So it has some stuff. Um, I, the, it's, <coughs> it's not, I, I would stick with MAS as far as for, for, for full, the full experience and expecting everything. There's some bits of it that kind of work in AWS. Um, 2.1, which is in beta 5, <coughs> What I probably didn't emphasize is that Juju deals when you create an XD <coughs> container and you want to plumb that into particular network spaces. It deals with all the underlying bridging and um, uh, wiring of those uh, containers into the underlying network fabric that the physical servers are actually attached to. So again, you can, that's all handled by Juju. And I think in, in 2.1, that's relatively hot pluggable for containers as well. So. <coughs> Okay, if there's uh, no more questions, um, well, thank you for your time. Um, if you want to try this stuff out, um, we've already talked about Fender up in the first session. Uh, that will allow you to deploy uh, all in one on your laptop using LexD containers if you haven't got a few spare servers kicking around, but it will also allow you to interact with a MAS deployment and deploy a multi node um, uh, bundle and configuration as, as I showed you earlier. Um, if you're interested in the OpenStack charms or, or want, to, want some support in using them or want to come and help develop them, um, hash OpenStack charms on Freenode IRC is probably the right place, the best place to find the most people um, in that community. Um, it's, it's a relatively active channel both for development and use. So please pop in and say hello and uh, thank you for your time. <laughs>